Called the Enfield Inland Wetlands and Watercourse Agency meeting of Tuesday, February 5th, 2013 to order. Can I have roll call, please? Joe Marie. Joe Marie Nelson. Here. Roby Staples. Here. Donna Corbin Sabinski. Here. Frank Alimo. Here. Jill Kravitz. Here. Brian Peruda. Joseph Perello Jr. John Ungeyer. Here. Joseph Albert. Okay, um, for tonight's meeting, I'd like to seat Frank Alimo as a full voting member. Um, fire evacuation announcement. In case of fire, there are two ways out to exit the chambers. To my left, exit through the council chamber doors, turn left, walk down one flight of stairs and out of the building, or exit the door to the rear of the chambers. In either case, once outside of the building, walk a safe distance away from the building. Can we stand for uh, Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next item is executive session. We have nothing tonight, Jim, right? Correct. Okay. Um, public participation. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to address the agency um, with issues of concern not on the agenda. Okay. Public hearings, we have none scheduled. Correspondence, Jim. In your packet, you will find uh, several notice of actions from the Enfield Planning and Zoning Commission uh, dating from December 6th through January 17th. Also included in the packet was a um, copy of the application permit to the state uh, DEP for applying pesticides in state waters. Uh, in particular, this is for uh, Shaker Pines Lake. This is the company that does it every year. Every year they give us a copy. They're going to do it again this year. Uh, also, you'll find the uh, year four end of growing season report from GZA uh, regarding the uh, Hampton Inn Hotel uh, on the corner of Hampton and Phoenix. Uh, as part of the original wetlands permit, uh, 444, they uh, are required to submit a yearly report by a consultant to demonstrate the effectiveness and the, and the quality of the plants that were put in each year and if they are taking, if the evasives are, are going or dying back. And um, the report is, is very favorable and everything there is working as planned. That was my question is if you had a synopsis on it because it's pretty technical, so. It, it, was, a, you know, it was quite the effort out there. Right. Uh, it covers a lot of acres, uh, a lot of different plantings, a lot of different um, areas, uh, some more just for forest area, some for uh, aquatic life, um, and it's all, it's all going as planned. Okay. Okay, and that's it for correspondence. Um, but then you, you also put in here the building permit oh, approvals? Oh, I'm sorry. Right? Did, yep, did I miss that? Oh, yep. As you can see, the uh, the sheds, additions, and decks and pools have slowed down through the winter months. Uh, between December 20th and January 16th, we've only had uh, six permits come in, uh, two addition, three additions, one shed, one pool, and, and one new house. Okay. And the, and the one new house was on and approved uh, a lot. Okay. Any questions for Jim? Um, next on the agenda is commissioner correspondence. Start down at the end. Roby, you have anything? No. Donna? No, I don't think. Joseph? Nothing. Jill? No. Thank you. John? Thank you. No. Okay. Um, I have a, a couple items. Just wanted to make sure everybody um, saw Jose's email. Um, he sent it out February 4th regarding the um, PNZ has scheduled a meeting on February 11th at 7 and the chambers here 
um, to discuss the progress on implementing the goals and objectives of the Enfield Plan of Conservation and Development. So um, an email went out to everybody. If you'd like to attend, it's probably a good idea because um, we everybody's encompassed in that, all the land use boards. So um, secondly, um, Jose also sent out, and I don't have the email, the Connecticut land use law um, for municipal land use agents. There's another uh, meeting at Wesleyan in Middletown on March 16th. It's an all-day 8.30 to 4.30 event. And if you're interested, let him know. And um, last week, Donna, myself, Roby, Frankie attended um, the land use board meeting that was held um, in conjunction with the town attorney. And we had um, a bunch of information given to us. So if anybody's interested, you're welcome to take it and take a look at it. Um, some good good subjects were touched upon. Um, I think we, we learned a little bit here and there. So um, if those pop up in the future, I suggest if you can make them, try to, try to make them. But here's what I have if you want to take a look. And that's all I have. Okay, next item on the agenda is approval of minutes, December 18, 2012, regular meeting. Okay, is there a motion? Move, move them be approved. Okay, motion made by Frankie. Okay. Second. Second by Donna. Is there any discussion? No discussion? Okay, all in favor? Okay. Opposed? Abstentions? Two abstentions, okay. Next item on the agenda is Wetlands Agent Report. Jim? Nothing to report. Uh, it's been very quiet in the world of wetlands. Um, as you know, the last couple of meetings have been canceled. There hasn't been any applications until now. We have three to be accepted tonight. Uh, and that's it. We can move on to that. Okay. No bond releases. Um, we have nothing under old business, nothing under new business. Number 15A, new applications to be received. Inland Wetlands, number 552, Brian Russo. Construction of a single family house located at 105 Steel Road. Proposed activity within a regulated area, map 51, lot 001. Submitted 129.13. Received 2513. PPE is 219.13. And MAD is uh, 410.13. Mr. Russo here? No, nobody representing Mr. Russo? Okay. No, I, I told him that we were just going to accept it. Um, Russo is the engineer. Um, has been in contact with me. I said tonight's meeting we would just uh, Just accepting the accept application? It. Yes. Okay. So are they going to be here at the next meeting, next meeting to correct. discuss it? Yes. Okay. Yep. And all the activity is, as you can see on the, on the plan, is um, within the regulated area uh, nothing's actually in the wetland and the, the majority of that disturbance is from a uh, future barn shown on the plan with some grading around it was what a future barn the, the oh, plan view shows a future a barn. barn i thought you said bar <laughs> no barn <laughs> um and and the grading associated with that okay Um, next on the agenda is XIW 1304, Thompsonville Fire District. Construction of a new fire station located at 35 North Main Street. Proposed activity within a regulated area, map 28, lot 099. Submitted 125.13, received 25.13, PPE 219.13, and MAD 410.13. Madam Chairman, I'm going to be recusing myself for this application. Good evening, Madam Chairman, members of the Commission. Uh, for the record, Attorney Carl Landolina from Fahey and Landolina in Windsor Locks, um, representing the applicant. I'm joined, uh, I guess to my right, now to my left, by Mr. Guy Hesketh from F.A. Hesketh and Associates, our project engineer. And uh, Guy will just take you through the uh, application this time. Can you set up here? Can we do it typically? Um, yeah, I, you might want to turn it a little more towards us, I think, so they can get a better shot at it. I th there you go. Yeah. 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 So 
about as good as it's going to get. For me? We're ready. Good evening. For the record, my name is Guy Hesketh. I'm a licensed professional engineer with F.A. Hesketh & Associates. Our corporate offices are located in East Granby, Connecticut, and our firm put together the plans and some of the other materials that were submitted as part of this application for the Thompsonville Fire District. What we're looking at is the construction of a new firehouse located on the corner of North Main Street and Lincoln Street. The, uh, the parcel of record is about 1.5 acres. We're looking at only procuring about 1.1 acres of that parcel. And on the plans you have before you, that's shown as a dark line that circumvents the property. We're looking at constructing a building. It's about 11,000 square foot footprint. It has uh, overhead doors in the front and in the rear um, where the fire apparatus uh, enter and exit the building. There's a driveway that touches down on North Main Street. And that's primarily for the employees of the fire department and also the fire apparatus. Fire trucks will come in from uh, North Main Street, circumvent the building uh, around the eastern side and <coughs> turn on about 190 degree turn and enter the bay doors in the back and then they'll head towards the front so that they're ready to point it out towards North Main Street. It's another set of overhead doors in the front, so when there's an emergency, the overhead doors open and the equipment is dispatched and they exit out of North Main Street. And then in that other area uh, where that paved area is around the building, there's also some parking in the back. We've got 15 spaces delineated back there. Those are for the firefighters and a couple of extra spaces for the public. And then on the west side, on uh, Lincoln Street, we have another driveway that accesses Lincoln Street. And the purpose of that driveway is to provide access to a parking area which is located between the building and Lincoln Street. And the building, if you notice, is sort of an L-shaped, mainly an L-shaped building. The, the big square portion on the east is where the fire apparatus material, or the fire apparatus are kept. And then the, um, the area that's in the center, um, just immediately to the west of the, the big box, is the living quarters and then the farthest uh, western edge of the building is actually a, a, an area that has uh, offices and public access space. So we have um, a parking area that's located um, between Lincoln Street and the building. It has nine spaces and there's seven for the public and then you'll notice on the plan there's two spaces that are underneath a canopy. That's for the fire marshal and the fire chief to park their vehicles so if it snows or something they're protected from uh, the weather. The other seven spaces are public access and we, you'll notice there's a, a handicap accessible space that's there also. Uh, the reason for that, uh, that we have those spaces there, if someone comes in for a building permit review or some other business with the fire marshal or fire chief, there's a public area that they can enter. There's also a, a training room in that area, a public meeting room, that will be available to the public if there's a small group of, from the community that wants to have a meeting in there that the fire uh, district will make that meeting room available to the public. Um, the way we've designed this is uh, we have um, stormwater uh, system you can see delineated on the plan here. Well, let me, let me backtrack a little bit. The reason we're before you here this evening is because uh, even though we have no direct impact, impact to wetlands on the project, but there are no direct wetlands impacts, we are within the 200-foot up and review, review area of Freshwater Brook. You're all familiar with the area. If you go across Main Street, there's a walking path, and then there's the... Um, Freshwater Brook, which is located down at a lower elevation. I've delineated down on the plan with the sort of the thick blue line, that's the edge of Freshwater Brook. And the dashed line that you see in a semicircular arc um, that roughly goes about halfway, um, splits the building in two essentially. That's the 200 foot upland review area. So that area is, falls within your area of jurisdiction. We, um, though we have no direct wetlands impacts or impacts of the water course, we do have stormwater discharge that will take place and will flow into Freshwater Brook. So I've delineated on the plan, you can see another blue line, a series of blue lines that begin behind the facility. 
pick up. Can you my... point those out? Yeah. I'm not sure I'm following you. Can you hear me from here? Yep. Uh, this is the stormwater management system we have. We have a catch basin located here, a storm drain culvert, another catch basin, storm drain culvert, a manhole. Comes down the front of the building, mm -hmm. picks up a yard drain located here to a hydrodynamic separator structure, which receives runoff again from another catch basin in this parking area. And then it's discharged to an existing storm drain system that's located on uh, North Main Street. Uh, can you hold for one moment? I think they might not hear you while you're standing up there. Is that correct? Okay. Kathy's not here tonight. We're, we're lacking. <laughs> Thank you. So the, the storm drainage system that we're, we're proposing, again, it begins in the rear of the plaza. It picks up stormwater from the paved area in a catch basin, blows through a culvert to another catch basin located on the east side of the building. Another culvert that picks up, uh, because there's a change in direction here, there's a manhole, which also receives runoff from the roof runoff. Uh, the culvert continues uh, in western direction, gets picked up by a, a structure here, which is a yard drain, and then flows to a hydrodynamic separator that we have located here, which also receives runoff from the paved parking area here adjacent to Lincoln Street. And then it discharges through a culvert to the existing storm drain system, which is located on North Main Street. And this system's been here for a number of years. When the main, North Main was reconstructed, that was installed. And that has a couple of culverts that pick up runoff from a couple catch basins on uh, North Main and then discharges through a 15-inch reinforced concrete pipe to a flared end section adjacent to uh, the bank of Freshwater Brook. So we're going to tie into that existing storm drain system there. And the, uh, the, um, the type of sedimentation erosion control measures that we'll implement during construction to protect um, the stormwater and prevent any sediments from leaving the site. We're proposing to ring the uh, down gradient areas of the site with sill fence erosion control that you see here. Also along the northern boundary and also on the uh, northern western portion of the project, sill fence erosion control. That will pick up any of the sediments on during construction. We'll have hay bale erosion checks installed in the new structures that are that are proposed here, the new inlets for the storm drain system. And then the existing uh, storm drain catch basin out on North Main, we're gonna put a silt sack in there um, to protect that. And again, a construction exit that we'll propose here that will be used as an anti-tracking pad during construction. And um, again, once the area is uh, completely stabilized, um, those, those uh, erosion control measures will be removed so that's it in a nutshell what we're proposing. Um, again, no direct wetlands impacts. We are, with, again, again within the 200-foot upland review areas represented by the blue dashed line here. And um, we're hoping that you'll see or agree with us that this um, activity does not constitute a significant activity, and we're looking for consideration and approval on this. Okay. Jim? Okay, um, Mr. Heskis has been in to uh, meet with our ART, with Jose and with uh, John Cabibbo and all the other uh, town staff. Uh, one of the things that we, of course, asked to talk about was the drainage. Um, Mr. Heskis has submitted drainage calculations to show uh, no no increase, correct? And no, no, it's very minimal if there is, right? It's very. Uh, yeah, regarding the uh, stormwater management, um, because we're located in the lower reaches of Freshwater Brook watershed, uh, the actual best management practices are not to detain stormwater runoff because if you detain stormwater runoff on the, the lower reaches of a watershed, you could actually result in increased runoff for the watershed as a whole. So the idea being is you want to have any peak increase, a nominal peak increase, you want to get into the water course prior to the peaking of the entire watershed itself. So there are no proposed um, stormwater um, detention facilities. However, 
we did do a, a hydrologic uh, ana analysis on all of the culverts and the catch basins, including the existing structure that's here, and we do meet the town standard, and we have adequate capacity uh, to convey all of the stormwater runoff without there being any, uh, any potential flooding to the streets. And you have a copy of that information? I do, okay. yes. And that was, yeah, what I was saying about the no increases being that the capacity in the, in the street and the pipes is adequate, as you said. And one of the things that we've talked about uh, in, 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 the, excuse me, in the engineering department with John is that just what Mr. Heskis talked about was when you're that far down in a watershed, when you retain the water for too long, you actually allow the water upstream to come down and fill the brook, and then when you release the water from this area, it adds to the flooding problems. So the lower you you are in, in watersheds, um, we like to see it be released sooner the better. Not not you know untreated or or without uh, you know with some huge increase in in the pre development uh, cut the pre pre development um, quantity, but it's not a good idea to hold it back for any length of time. And in this plan, in this small area. Uh, treatment is going to be achieved through a, uh, a device called a um, storm scepter, is that correct? Um, and that would be something that uh, treats and catches any sediment. And I believe it has a 82 percent um, removal efficiency um, based on the sizing of, you know, based on the quantity of, of uh, storm water. Uh, it will remove 82 percent of the of sediment that's trapped in there. So. That's that's good to have every before freshwater broke, um, so I'm happy with that. Yes. Okay. Um, questions from that? Yeah, from the agency. I just had a quick question. Is is this the separator that you're talking about? Is this this hydrodynamic? Correct. Separator Correct. that yeah. you're talking about? Yes. Okay. Could could you explain just quickly how that works? Yeah. Essentially, what a hydrodynamic separator is, it, it's a, um, a circular structure similar to a manhole, and it has an insert in it that's a um, fiberglass and metal um, composite that fits inside it. And as stormwater flows into it, it directs the runoff through a baffle structure and um, to allow settling of the material that comes into it, primarily the uh, suspended solids material and then also some floating debris, you know, cigarette butts, coffee cups, things of that nature. And then it's designed primarily to catch the first flush, because usually what happens in, in um, parking lots is the first uh, few minutes of runoff that you have during a rainstorm is when you get all of the nasty stuff that comes down into your system. And then as the, as the flow increases, the, the wear structures overpass and then the flow bypasses this, the wear apparatus and then flows directly out. So the, the um, EPA has what they call a swim model which is a stormwater management um, model that they look at the average rainfall over the course of the last 30 years or so. And then you look at uh, what is the efficiency of this structure. And by modeling using the, the EPA uh, recommended model, you end up with about 82 percent removal efficiency. So for the very small storms, you have literally um, a higher percentage of, you might have 90, 95 percent of sediments. In a big storm, you may have a little bit less, but on the average annual removal, you end up with about 82 percent efficiency for total suspended solids. And that's a good rate? That's Yeah, the, the uh, Connecticut DEP wants to see a minimum of 80 okay. percent. So you can size these facilities. You know, in a small watershed like this, we have about an acre. Usually the, the, what they call the 450, which is a 450 cubic foot model, will suffice for that. And if you get larger, then you get into larger models. Okay. So we ran it with the 450 and we get the 82 percent. So is there a recommended clean out schedule? Yeah, they um, we, we actually included that's another thing I forgot to right. mention. Um, and there was submitted a revised grading plan which has um, a long-term stormwater and overall site maintenance plan. Yeah. What's recommended on those is, um, and that's included on the on the submittal I made today. Mm -hmm. Well, what the uh, manufacturer recommends on those is there that they they be inspected annually, and typically the the times you do that are um, in late spring after the winter sanding operations are completed. And then again in, in the fall after the leaves fall off the trees. So these things are inspected a minimum of twice a year. And then uh, when they reach, I think it's about 20% uh, of their capacity, then the materials are removed from there. And that has to be done by um, special guys that specialize in like catch basin cleaning. The baffle cover pops off, and then they can get in there and, and with a the vacuum apparatus 
remove the sediment, any debris that's in there. So we, in our maintenance plan, it'll be have to have to be looked at twice, twice a year. So those are the the people that clean it are also the ones that inspect it for you. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And and not only the um, the hydrodynamic separator, but the catch basins themselves have two foot sums in them, and they'll they'll provide for uh, sediment removal also, and those are cleaned again, inspected inspected twice a year, and then when they reach 50% of their um, capacity, those are cleaned. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And you'll, you'll find that uh, maintenance schedule on the revised sheet that you'll find in the packet you got today. Um, that came from a from discussion uh, at our ART meeting, and uh, Mr. Heskis revised that sheet, and I included it in, the, in your today's packet. And this, this was... Um this is okay with you too, Jim? Yeah, it, and what I would recommend is that we incorporate that language into the permit uh, so that it becomes a, a matter of record and that we have something to hold them to. Okay. Um, any other questions? We'll start down there. Roby? What you're saying is there's no like, Roby. more runoff than we have right there. Right now, the roof is there on the Higgins School. The blacktop is there. Everything else is there. We're going to make it better. We'll, we's accept that because the Higgins school's been there forever. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, and when you look at the overall size of the watershed, um, which is, and I don't know how Freshwater Brook is several hundred acres, I believe it is. Uh, we're looking at a one acre site at the very end of the mm -hmm. watershed. And hydraulically, if you were to model it, it wouldn't wouldn't even show up on the radar. Right. And again, um, with the, with the management practice that we have there, we don't believe there's, there's any um, detriment at all to. We're to actually going to get a little less because we, a year ago, I believe, we put drainage down Lincoln Street, uh, Bigelow Avenue, Hartford Avenue, into the other, going the other way. The other way, yeah. So uh, it can only get better with this operation. Anything else, Rip? No, that's it. Donna? Well, I was just wondering when you wash the fire trucks on that, is that going to go into these drains too? or? No, that's a good question, and, and I didn't bring that up. I should have. Um, you're not by statute allowed to discharge non-stormwater sources to stormwater um, discharges. Oh, so what we have, um, we are going to have in place in here, and this is also required by the uh, Connecticut DEEP, is a um, for any type of vehicle service mm -hmm. and they include washing or any type of maintenance and uh, the plan here is to wash the vehicles that'll be done inside mm -hmm. and there will be floor drains in the building <coughs> and those floor drains themselves um, will discharge to a uh, what they call an oil grit separator and then from there that'll be connected to the sanitary sewer and the oil grit separator is uh, we're required to have a minimum of a thousand gallon oil grit separator. I believe we spec a 1,500 gallon um, oil grit separator here. Essentially what that is, it's very similar to a septic tank. It's a concrete structure that's that's below ground. It's epoxy coated on the inside to prevent any kind of corrosion to the concrete. And it has a, a, a T-pipe, which is a, a six inch diameter PVC pipe that comes in from the inlet and another one on the outlet. And that's designed to, uh, any sand will get caught in the bottom of the structure and then any oils or anything will float on the surface. And um, what happens is they're sort of self-regulating because once you get to a point where uh, enough sand builds up in there, then they'll notice in the building that the uh, floor drains don't drain anymore. So they call a service company, the same kind of guys that come out to do the catch basins, clean those also, and they remove all the sand and any of the, any of the grit or any of the oil materials that are in there. So, yeah, again, that'll discharge the sanitary sewer, so it'll be totally se separate from the stormwater discharge. Thank you. Um, just because I don't know a whole lot about those, how often do they normally need to be cleaned out? Yearly? Um, it it depends on the sand loading. Okay. It, it's interesting. Um, they used to um, used to recommend about once a year that they be inspected. And a lot of times, they only had to be cleaned every couple of years. A lot of municipalities now are using a lot lot less sand than they used to use a few years ago, including the, the uh, state Department of Transportation. You know, if you notice, they're using calcium chloride and other type of sprays. So um, it's probably going to be like a two to three year interval on that. It depends on, again, how much sand it gets in there. Because 90% of the stuff that, that is, is the residual that falls off the vehicles um, when they're driving around and they get sand on them. And they're just not using sand like they used to. So the, the time interval probably, I'd, I'd, I'd say if I had to guess about every three years or so. So is there any kind of maintenance uh, schedule on that as well? or? 
Uh, we don't have one specifically on the plan. That's something we certainly can add. But you know, we can. I would, if if the commission feels this is um, something they'd like to recommend, I would recommend at least a minimum of once in a year to have it inspected. And if it's 50 percent of its um, capacity, then have it cleaned out. There's no standard for that. No. Yeah. Again, it's it's not not really because um, depends on you know how much how much sand builds up in there. And then, again, this will be reviewed by your Water Pollution Control Authority. Um, I, you know, Dan Parisi is familiar with this. Um, they're used on a lot of facilities. And uh, right. you know, there may be some spe uh, stipulations from the permit that we get for a connection for water pollution control. Okay. 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 Jill? Um, I had a question, and maybe, Jen, you can help me with this. The um, person that inspects the storm scepter is also the cleaner. Is there any conflict of interest in that? I mean, if they say, well, it's fine, we don't need to clean it, or will they say they want to clean it because that it needs to be clean? Is there a conflict of interest there? I, I can't speak at the conflict of interest. Uh, the way that I would suggest that we issue a permit is include the long-term stormwater system and overall site maintenance plan language. Uh, and part of that is that they are required to inspect the catch basins and separator structures semi-annually, uh, and then maintain the records uh, in, in their building uh, for those cleanouts. And then if we feel that we want to knock on their door and, and ask them to see the records, then we can do that. Um, so there's no, no reporting, no automatic reporting, but documents sh should be available for anyone who wants to see them. Okay, thank you. Actually, I had another question. Donna made me think of it. Um, it. I didn't even, I wasn't thinking of the cleaning, but as far as Higgins now, we don't put salt on that and sand and things like that because people aren't using the parking lot normal, you know, every day. But there would be salt put down. I see that that's in the plan here. So the storm scepter is going to um, prevent the salt from going in the freshwater brook? No. Um, these structures or, or these uh, devices are designed for um, what they call gross particle separation, um, suspended solids. Salt would be a dissolved solid. So there's really no mechanism that we would install in here that would remove salt. That would be a very expensive technology. So it would be, I mean, right now we're not throwing salt into the, the, the brook. And it, I mean, it's not a big impact. There's yeah. not gonna be a lot. And I see that they're trying to minimize that as much as possible. You know, what I could suggest is that um, the amount of salt that would be used here would, would probably be about on par with whatever we used on the public roads themselves. Um, no, nothing more than that. In fact, um, they probably will be a little bit more selective on site than what they would. Because when you're, when you're, when you're uh, spreading salt on the streets, a lot of times, you know, if the, if the truck driver stops for a second and the, and, the, and the apparatus is spinning, there may be a big pile of salt or something left there. This type of um, operation here would probably just be scattered by hand mostly. Okay. Thank you. Yep. I, I just want to clarify for everyone that this parcel is adjacent to the Higgins School, not, not the same as the school. The school is to the right of this parcel. So that parking lot, that building is, is not affected by what's being proposed here. It's two separate lots. Okay. But if I could add something to that, um, one of the um, one of the things that we're doing here as part of the site is there's a, 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 a significant amount of um, excavation that will be done here because the site has a little bit of a mound on there. The town has asked that if they could utilize that fill. Um, when the Higgins School is removed, they're going to replace that, um, fill in the hole, and then they're going to, my understanding is that they're going to have, um, you know, convert that to some lawn areas. So just some of the material on our site will actually go over to, to fill so in that, the That the was pond. one of my questions in the construction sequence number eight. Stockpile excess excavated soil on a, um, adjacent Higgins School lot, as instructed by the town of Enfield. That's yeah. We, we don't have the details of that figured out yet because my understanding is the schedule for the demolition of the Higgins School is supposed to take place in this spring. Okay. But again, they're still working on some of the finer details of that, and they've asked the town has asked that the district cooperate with them, and that we certainly are willing to do that. Okay. And you you had planned to start this in the spring as well, correct? Uh, that's the intent. Okay. So are you waiting? To, the Higgins has to come down first before you could go forward with your portion? Um, not necessarily. I mean, we could we could remove material and then stockpile it adjacent to the school itself. And, you know, any, any of that work would be done, we'd work with 
you know, wetland staff and make sure that the um, the stockpiles are properly ringed with silt fence and things like that. But we just don't know the definitive schedule at this point. Joe? Uh, the only question I pretty much had on this whole project was um, snow stockpile. That's the only we require it for other applicants, so I just want to make sure that, you know, it's on the plants and it's delineated on the plants. Uh, most of the other applicants that come in, that's basically uh, the only concern I had. Other than that, everything else looks fine. Um, I don't know if in the northwest corner of the back parking lot there, where the, you've got some plantings there uh, with some bark mulch. I don't know if that's something that really needs to, um, if you need to put that there or if you can just make it make it uh, paved maybe in that corner and just have a corner corner area to where you can stockpile that snow i know it's going to be difficult to to pile all that snow from what i'm looking at the plans there's no other spot other than that really and everything else um maybe on the the northwest corner on lincoln street there uh where you got some some bark mulch and some uh I don't know if you can, if we can put a, st a snow stockpile there and eliminate some of those plantings there, just so that you have a place to stockpile the snow. The other stuff on the f the front of Main Street, North Main Street, um, that's mostly the front lawn. So I don't think you'd want to really do that. I think it'd be a line of sight issue also. But those those two corners there, the two northwest corners of the property, I don't know if if it's possible that we could maybe have the stockpile snow stockpile in that area, but. Other than that, I don't see a problem with any of these plans at all. That's all. That's the only concern I had. For the record, Carl Landolina. One of the things that um, we're required to do in the zoning regulations, because the adjacent parcel is zoned residential mm -hmm. and in a residential use, we're required to have a certain buffer. Right. And that buffer has to be vegetated. Okay. So um, that's one of the reasons, obviously, that we're showing the plantings there. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, impervious surface, we've also got a, a coverage requirement that we can't go over. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how close we are, but if we would have paved some of those areas, we'd probably be over in terms of our coverage. But I mean, if if Jose and, and the folks at planning and zoning don't have a problem with us removing some of the plantings in those two areas so we could pile snow there, I, I think we'd certainly be willing to do that. I, I'm just looking at it. For your con sure. on your your concern, I mean, yep. because the east side you really have no place to really park the snow anywhere. Right. The south side you kind of have no place to park it. It's pretty much the north north side of the building um, is the only place that you really really can stockpile the snow unless you literally remove it from the the site and that could be really costly right. in, in the end. And I don't want to see you incur that that extra cost so. But we we can take that up with uh, with Jose okay. and see if that's something that he thinks the commission would would think would be appropriate. Question: The Planning and Zoning Commission. We had there was some discussion earlier about fencing um, that you know fencing around where that residential property is. The owner of uh, the property has asked us not to put a fence there. Um, one of the reasons is there. There is some pavement. You can see where the the buffer line and the trees kind of dip in a little bit. Yeah. Uh, that's actually pavement from which encroaches onto the town's property from that abutter to the north. Um, and he needs a place to pile his snow as well. So I guess he, we're all just going to look the other is way. Is he encroaching on this property or are you encroaching on his He's property? He's encroaching on your property, the town's property. The town's property. Actually ours. So, so, so we're going to allow this person to well, we don't snow know what stockpile we're allow and we don't have it. a snow stockpile for the fire department. <laughs> Maybe so, we could share. <laughs> but um, so, I mean, we'll talk to Jose about removing some of the in that wet northwest corner there. And I assume you're, you're discussed or talking about uh, along this, that north, the both northerly west corners. Right? Yeah, the north that, where it jets out, where yeah. it jets there in that corner. I was. I was just thinking that's the only basically yeah it looks like at this point the only, only place spot that you could possibly put that snow pile um, 
like I said, it's just be I only brought that up because a lot of our other applicants that we asked for that. So I want okay. I want to be uh, fair across the board. Sure. So. No, that's a good point. Um, I, I just do you have more questions, Donna? Yeah, I did in regards to that. Um, wouldn't the landowner be not happy having a stockpile right there next to their yard? Would it impact their yard? I wouldn't be happy. Well, he's using it as a stockpile right there. Uh, right. He's it currently would. pushing his snow onto the town property. Would it, right. is he? And actually parking cars on the town property as well. Be a lot more snow, that's all. Yeah. And that the property hasn't there. transferred yet. Yeah. Not yet. Has not, no. Um, I, I just have one question. Are there any hazardous materials stored on site? site? We had a, uh, a phase Maybe. one environmental analysis completed by GZA, who completed the, the lengthy landscaping, whatever. He's here. Oh, there he is. Yeah. So if you want to hear from him, he'd be glad to tell you. But the upshot is that um, he is not concerned about any materials on the site. And, um, but, but Stan Gagne from John, is here. If you'd like to too. hear from him, but yeah. I didn't know if your question was: Are they going to be storing any? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, both, I guess, okay. would be. Yeah. yeah. Sure. You just state your name for the sure. record. It's uh, Stanley Dinya. I live in Enfield. And I'm uh, principal at GZA Geo Environmental, and we did a Phase One environmental site assessment for the property to look at the uh, past uses to see if there was any evidence of. Uh, oil or hazardous materials and uh, based on the review of the site and the uh, review of records at DEEP and the local records <clears throat> there was no information found that indicates that there are any recognized environmental conditions associated with the property. There were some on some of the surrounding properties but in a position that didn't appear that they would affect this property. And in terms of what they might be storing you know, for the fire apparatus, I think the chief could speak to that if you uh, want some additional okay. information. Thank you. Sure. I have a question. Yeah, over. please. Good evening. Frank Alimo, Chief Thompsonville Fire Department. Um, as far as any hazardous materials inside, they uh, could be gas cans for generators or uh, hand tools that we use, uh, saws and those types of things, but those all fall under an OSHA standard that we have to have it in a contain in a compartmentized, fireproof, explosion-proof container. So if they are, they have to be followed by OSHA standards, which will, again, they'll be enclosed in an area um, and safe, okay. and under NFPA uh, standards. There's there's so many standards that we have to follow in this building, other than a normal building, because it's a uh, essential service building. Um, we even have to have a different uh, uh, geological rating for earthquakes, which we're, which we're going through now. So the hazardous materials, gasoline, oil, those types of things for our saws and okay. generators. That's about it. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Frank? No. Not for Frank. No. Okay. Jim, do you have anything else? No. Oh, you had another question? Yeah, I had a question. Okay. It wasn't directly for Frank. No, go but, right ahead. Uh, yeah. um, if I, I see here that in your plan you have a 1,000-gallon grease trap, 1,000-gallon grease trap. Could you explain, please, uh, briefly the uh, purpose and function of that, and does it represent uh, any risk at all to the wetlands? Yeah. Um, any... Uh, restaurant or food service establishment by code is required to have a grease trap. Um, we're proposing to put one in here because there will be a sizable kitchen and potentially um, the, um, a lot of cooking going on. And um, the grease trap is required um, by water pollution control and the primary purpose is, is to prevent grease buildup in the sanitary sewer lines in the street itself. What the grease trap is, again, it's very similar to a septic tank. Um, the the, um, suit, the waste from the kitchen only enters into the, the, to the trap itself, and the floating grease and oils will float to the surface, and the, the, the uh, effluent will pass through it, and then um, about once every uh, six months or so, it 
it's inspected and the grease portion is removed from it. Um, as far as a hazard to uh, potential for the wetlands and things, uh, if this were um, in an area that were inundated during a flood or something like that, there's a potential for that. But again, we're above the flood elevation. Um, there's no really risk associated with that. Um, no more so than any of the um, sanitary sewers that are that are located in the street adjacent to the river. So it's it's essentially for for kitchen waste is what it what it's designed for. Okay, thank so, you. So guys, there's, there's no way that that material could enter the uh, the drain on you know on site storm drainage system unless there was a flood in the building and it got carried outside of the building yeah it's um it's totally separated and segregated from the stormwater system again it's tied into the sanitary sewer system and the, the risk is um is, is minuscule at most okay thank you thank you any other questions okay thank you gentlemen um thank any you. discussion so um, I believe what we're here tonight is to decide whether this is a regulated activity that would require a permit or if we believe this can be an agent approval, um, which would mean th that the activity would result in no greater than a minimal impact on the wetlands. Um, so I guess that's what we're here to determine tonight. Um, if there's any discussion that would like to be had, we can have that now. We believe this is requiring a public hearing. I mean, all that can be discussed right now. So, thoughts? I have no thoughts at all on this. I think it's fine. All right. Does any motions want to be made, or I'll make a motion that the uh, the applicant is uh, this project is there's no adverse effects on the wetlands or water courses, and um, with the 16 standard conditions and the long term uh, long term storm water proposal for uh, the stormwater system and overall site maintenance plan on the, uh, the map that we have here that, that was given to us. Okay, so Joe has made a motion um, on XIW 13-04 uh, with the to uh, issue a permit with the 16 standard conditions and the uh, long-term stormwater system and overall site plan maintenance plan that Jim provided to us this evening. Um, is there a second on this? Second. second by Roby. Okay. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Unanimous. Okay. 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 Next on the agenda. I assume what you just did was to give the authority to your agent to issue a permit Correct. a couple of weeks from now. Yep. Correct. Yep. Thank you. You're all set. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And I'll, I'll work with work with a guy directly and we'll get this done. Uh, what I want to do is I want to wait till they get through planning and zoning, just so everyone knows, before I write the approval and issue it. I want Just so we have the right page numbers, we have all the right, you know, we don't want to do it three times. So just in case there's any changes. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. Okay, next item on the agenda is other business, A, Heritage Farms Condo Maintenance Permit Extension. Um, Do we have any discussion or? I'm sorry, I mean to interrupt. Uh, we also have the uh, another application that came in. Oh, right, that's, yeah. Came I'm in. sorry, uh, okay, so we'll back up. Right. Madam Chair, I'm back. Oh. Okay. okay. So, yep. Joining the meeting. Frank Alimo has rejoined the meeting. Um, and your we're and your folders you have uh, on your desk tonight, there you'll find find a sheet. Enfield lodging. Enfield in, Inland Wetlands and Watercourse Agency applications received after packets went out. Um, there are some typo errors. I like to correct at this time. March 6, 2012, obviously was the last time we had one of these. <laughs> so that needs to oh. reflect today's date, which would be February 5th. Okay. 
2013. So, so that's a IW 444.02 Enfield Lodging LLC construction uh, of a restaurant. Uh, I'm sorry. And again, the one more typo is the inland uh, the, the permit number is going to change to 444.04. Um, if you refer back to your um, correspondence, you, the year four. Right. Well, I, it was given the wrong number because I just realized that if you go back to your um, annual report, um, the original permit for that area was 444, and then it was it was um, modified in 4402 and 4403. I believe there were some minor changes done over the years to that original permit, um, and when wanting to keep everything because it is the same parcel, wanting to keep it all together, I wanted to use 444. Zero four. Zero four. Door. Okay. So that way, when in our in house, it's all going to be kept together. Right. Enfield Lodging LLC construction of a restaurant located at 20 Phoenix Avenue. Proposed activity within a regulated area map 45 lot 012. Submitted 2113. Received 2513. PPE 21913 and MAD 41013. Okay, you're up, Jim. They're not here. They're not so here. So we're just receiving the application. Correct. And we have the plans. Yes, you have a, a set of plans. Um, I have a large set of plans here. Um, what was submitted? Uh, to a, my office was the plans as well as a drainage report uh, as well as an environmental report uh, by GZA uh, the same folks who did the the big report for the entire site um, all those reports speak towards the proposed change of the current detention basin uh, I believe we can get a good picture of it on uh, sheet seven sheet seven we could use that to talk about um, you'll see in the front along Phoenix Avenue uh, the existing detention basin is proposed to be uh, reduced in size to accommodate more parking uh, that parking is required by the proposed restaurant um, going through the reports uh, the increase uh, by making that, that basin smaller there is an increase in the runoff um, from this site. Uh, it's the equivalent of two cubic feet per second in a 100-year storm. It'll increase by two cubic feet per second. So it's very minimal. And again, as we heard from uh, Guy Heskis, and, and we do concur, uh, engineering and I do concur with the idea that being lower in the watershed, it's not such a bad idea to have things go a little faster, as long as they're clean. And um, you'll see from the correspondence this report this site has a lot of of uh, wetlands, um, man-made wetlands and natural wetlands. It's a lot going on in here. Um, the, the water that comes through here is treated very well before it gets out into the uh, into the freshwater brook. So that increase is is not going to have a significant impact at all. Okay. Um, so my my recommendation is. Um, that the plans are adequate, the reports are, are detailed and accurate, and um, it's it's up to you folks to, to let me know if you want to do this administratively or if you'd like to to have this go to a full application. Um, that pad has been there some since the hotel was built. Correct. Yeah, the actually. pad the pad site where they're oh. putting the restaurant yeah. uh, was all part of the original plan. Yeah. What what's being proposed that's different is they want to reduce that existing detention basin to add some more parking to accommodate that that tenant in that restaurant. So how much are they reducing it? Uh, if you, again, if you look on sheet seven, you can see where the existing berm is, and I believe it's about 12 feet. They're they're going to take about 12 feet from the uh, west side of the, of the detention basin. You know, it was, what they're going to do is to build a retaining wall. It'll be a, I think there's a small wall there now, and they're going to, as they come closer in the wall, get a little taller. It's about a seven foot wall at its highest point. Okay, so you're saying there's little to no impact Correct. wetlands on site Correct. based on what your calculations and everything? Yes. 
It, okay. There is an increase in, you know, the, the pre and the post, you know, mm -hmm. or just say existing and proposed mm -hmm. um, runoff. It does increase, mm -hmm. but it's two CFS in a 100-year storm, which is okay. very, very small. Right. Okay. Are there any questions for Jim on this? No? No? Well, discussion? Do you want to... Uh, authorize him to handle this administratively or go ahead yeah, just Frank. Jim did they already take care of like the grease trap and those type of things for restaurant use so oh yeah to, all that's all that's already there right yes yeah. yeah so it's ready to go basically other yes. than yep yeah. okay yeah, yeah they, no, and the reason why it's here in front of in front of you folks today is because of this change to mm -hmm. this request to add more parking and reduce the existing detention pace mm -hmm. uh, all those other uh, pad site you know all the other requirements from the pad site have been met previously in, in the original proposals right so. thank you okay. Mm -hmm. okay well somebody want to make a motion I'll make a motion that uh, Jim um, approve this administratively okay motion made by Joe seconded. seconded by Jill any discussion okay all in favor all righty Next item on the agenda, other business, Heritage Farms Condo Maintenance Permit Extension. We haven't, um, we haven't really done much on this. We were going to maybe set up a special meeting to talk about this, which I'd still like to do, because I'm hoping springtime maybe we'll start to get busy. I don't know. And uh, one thing that um, I did notice reading the, our current regulations, again, under agent approval, that is one of the items that's spelled out is is permits for maintenance of existing basins. And we have that already in our in our regulations. That you you would have the yes the, the authority to right. That, but would they have to apply for a permit? Right, they had to apply. We could make that a, a little more streamlined of an application. But I think what what was expressed from the folks at Heritage Farms was that it took quite a bit for them to get that first permit um, to do the work that they're they're doing, and that. His concerns and what he, why he came in looking for this this new way of doing permit extensions was so that his uh, you know, the people who followed him in, in the condo association would not have to go through the same uh, lengthy process um, that he went through to do their maintenance. But if we we make it clear that maintenance can be handled quickly and without weeks and months of meetings and and review and and uh, Expense on their part, you know, getting you know engineered plans put together and whatnot. We still require some plans, but it won't right. be, uh, like I said, it won't be what they had experienced as being the process to get something, get some maintenance done. Right. So this may be something we could look at and be the simple answer. I like answer. that idea. Okay. Yeah. Um, maybe you can reach out to him and okay. discuss that with him and see what his thoughts are. Great. Okay. Um, then we have the IWW. A is still missing. Um, official map update <laughs> discussion, but I'm not going to complain because it's in our packet. <laughs> so briefly, I know we're just going to touch touch about, touch base on what this is all about, and then go into more discussions on this later. But very colorful. Okay, uh, just to give a brief description of what you see in front of you is, uh, as you see, it's the town of Enfield unofficial wetlands map. Uh, what you have here is the escarpments in red, and that's pretty obvious. Um, what you see in the solid green, uh, as well as what's green and blue striped, would be our, would reflect our map as it is today. Um, so underneath the striped areas, it would be green as well. Uh, what is striped in in blue and green would be our new proposed wetland layer. And then areas on the map where you see just solid green would no longer be considered wetlands. Okay. Um, where you see that, where that really shows the most is right through the, the uh, center, uh, lower center of, of Enfield through the very, uh, Residential. The, yeah, the residential, I'm sorry. Okay. The, the, the developed areas uh, where that's green um, because 
those soils, those those that map, the original map, the map that we have now, was based on the 1961 soil survey, and that 61 was when the soil survey was released. That mapping might have done been done in, in 51, 58. Who knows when they actually walked through there to do that, do that um, mapping. Um, obviously, those houses were not there. That sub, you know, subdivisions were not planned or were not built, um, and is why they they showed up as, as wetlands. Uh, I'm not saying there aren't wetlands there, but we did not have wetlands regulations when those houses were built. There, there's nothing illegal about them. There's nothing, you know, <laughs> nothing we can do to to change that. They exist, um, and those wetlands are no longer functioning. They're no longer, uh, in my opinion, something we need to be mapping. And that's what the 2007 map, uh, the soil, sorry, 2007 survey reflects that. They did not map those as wetland soils. And you can see where the, where the striping has stopped and, and just the green. Okay. And I had mentioned briefly when, in discussions before, there are still some areas that make you want to scratch your head a little bit. And one particular would be the area just south of, of the Hampton Inn, what we just talked about. And you can see that's a very large area of green, and then for some reason it was not mapped as wetlands. So I is is my suggestion that we we look at this, we get a feel for it, and areas that we have some concerns about, we have someone go out and look at them. A soil scientist go out and and proof our map and just give it some some real uh, on the ground uh, validity, right. and then we can do that through the. Um, through Dave Askew, we could have right. him do it, or okay. or some other soil scientist. So if if you know of somewhere that that you know is definitely a wetland, or you feel is a wetland, and it does, it's not going to be on this proposed map, circle it, and we can put together all our circles and figure out where we want him to to do some more uh, testing. Why, why would it be on the map? I'm sorry. Why would it be accounted for on the map? Sorry, <laughs> Jim. Jim, <laughs> why? <laughs> why? Why would it not be accounted for on on this map? A wetland? Yeah, uh, you, clearly. You mentioned that area by the Hampton Inn, and likely, although I haven't physically been standing in that area, it likely it is it is a, it is a wetland, mm -hmm. but yet it's not accounted for on the map. Um, so why are there areas that clearly are that are not properly accounted for on the map? I can't answer that. I, that's that's the, the question. Okay. And that's why we need to find an answer. Have someone go out there, and um, maybe I, this. I guess. It, I guess. It, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. That's okay. But it, but it may it makes you think. Also, are there areas here that are accounted for as wetlands that may not be? Well, and the reason we're doing this revision is that I think we definitely have that situation now because using the data from 1961. Yeah, we do have areas that we're calling wetlands that are, have long since existed to be wetlands areas. Um, so, to so answer your original question, though, the the spacing, the required spacing for the soil survey is three acres. Uh, they try to do a testing every three acres. Um, you know, that's like the the minimum spacing of the, of the testing. Um, maybe in that area, it was densely wooded. They took a couple areas just on the outside, and they were not. Uh, and, and that's just how the map unit fell. It, you know, it could be something just an, you know, just a mathematical anomaly. Okay, so I'm looking at this map and I'm understanding it as essentially a, a work in progress. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so is there some some date or some deadline as to when we want to have this? Um, oh, <laughs> you, you've all been you've been very patient. This has been a year. <laughs> it's been in the year in the making. I don't think we can. <laughs> and it was several years before you. It was several so, years yeah. before that. Right. So this is the, all right. Yeah. right. This is this is progress okay <laughs> so I mean at this point we want to I don't know what what do we want to do do we want to have questions for you do we want to yeah. maybe have North Central go out there and maybe discuss what areas we want them to take a look at or yeah I if we all just yeah you said just digest it for a couple of weeks right. and, and you know if you know of an area circle it and we'll get together we can discuss it again we we'll each have our Okay. Maybe we we'll all have the same circles. Maybe we we'll all have different circles. We'll, you know, we'll start to start the dialogue. Yeah. Go ahead, Jim. I had a question, um, just actually to, to the commission and you, Jim. Um, this is a lot here, 
that that you've done and you brought forward to us. I I don't know. Maybe we should have some type of workshop on this. When, I don't know if a special meeting or a workshop that we can, I guess, cookie cut it or take an area, our area or your area, and and mm -hmm. put our input into it or have a discussion on it. Maybe not at a regular in the wetlands meeting, but yeah. just okay. a regular workshop so we can. Because if the public will go crazy if we're sitting up here okay. trying to dice this thing up, I mean. That's just a suggestion. Uh, yeah, if it, anybody else has yeah. anything and, else. And, and another aspect of this thing too is like we're, we're like in the middle of the winter right now, right. and is that the, really the best time to try to determine what's a wetland or not, or would you recommend a, a certain time of the year because the spring yeah. you get all the runoff. Sure, and, spring is, is probably your it, your it, most uh, you know skunk cabbage is a real good indicator. <laughs> so we could do a skunk cabbage inventory come spring, and, yeah. But so that might be a better time than say say now. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Okay. But and I, I want to. And I would suggest, you know, anybody even listening on TV that knows of areas that, you know, they're they're concerned about or think are right or wrong, I mean, they could shoot an email off to Jim and or any of us, you know, maybe to consider their areas because we don't know all areas of town. So, um, yeah. All right. So let's let's kind of just mull this over and then you know come back in a couple weeks and decide if we want to do a workshop and. Okay. Uh, just a question. Can you go over the colors again now? The blue and the green striping is new wetlands, what we think is new? Well, no, what will be, if we had just a map of, you know, if we adopted a new map, it would just show the, the striped areas. Mm -hmm. What you see in solid green would no longer be on this map. Now, in solid green, have they already been identified as wetlands? They were from the old, our the old map. map. Okay, yeah, correct. So, those would go away. Solid green. Correct. And what would remain potentially is anything with blue with a green stripe. Correct. Right. In the red, as you said. Red, obviously. Yeah. Red, yeah. Okay. Maybe that the green is still. Yeah. Still yeah. Okay. What's that? Yeah. But just make it. Just make it a point here that it may be that the green in some areas of the green may still be a wetland that Possibly. needs to be determined. Yeah. Right. And, and the, all it is is that what was shown on the 1961 soil survey for Hartford County and what was shown on the 2007 soil survey. And that's, that's, that's what you see here. That's what's been represented, those two sources of information. There's no ground, you know, no one went out and said, well, that is or isn't a wetland. It's based on those two sources. Right. So, so, so obviously there's different types of wetlands and wetland soils. Correct. Well, right. but that's not what this map is showing. Like, again, is the, the soil survey is a, a physical survey of of the land. Mm -hmm. um, most in, in the the testing. What is a uh, soil scientist goes out from from the uh, USD. I'm sorry, USDA Soil Conservation Service. I'm sorry, Natural Resource Conservation Service. And his his task is to take a sample roughly every three acres and identify the type of soil it is whether it's a, a Windsor soil or a um, you know, there's many types of soils, or is it a hydric soil, which is, would fall under the wetlands category? And he maps each of those soil types. It comes back to the office and maps that, that you know, maps those layers out. And so this is a compilation of what was mapped in 1961 versus what was mapped recently in 2007. Okay. And you can see there's a difference. Yes. So when it's all said and done, can we identify areas that Yes, there are wetlands there, but potentially with mitigation and retention can still be developable, usable land? Or will this be a flag that would say any of the land you see in whatever color it ends up is undevelopable? You know, what, what we do, with, do from this point is, is up to the agency and, and our, our public input. We may take both areas. We may say the new map contains both. That may be a recommendation. Or we get rid of the green, or we get rid of some of the green. There's, there's no straight answer. I think we can, we have to. Well, I think also when an applicant comes in front of us, they generally have a soil scientist that have gone out and flagged it and and done the research. So they come back and say it may not, you know, at one point it was, but it's non-functioning now. So right. I think any development that comes in front of us is going to have that specific site that we can yeah. determine, even if it is green on the map. Right. And, that, and that's where I was going yeah. with this become more user-friendly to f 
future developers who, who potentially would, yeah. would want to come in. I, I think the one benefit that I see that a new map will, will have is that in these areas that are definitely developed, these are right. quarter acre lots, yep. and they're solid green. And the house has been there since the 50s, 60s. When they want to do a shed, a, a, um, a deck, right. they need to come, they need to go through wetlands because it's green on this map. Yep. And I'm not sure that's really the right the right thing. I agree. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? No. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Um Next item on the agenda, next regular meetings, Tuesday, February 19th, 2013 at 7:30 in the Enfield room. And is there a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion to adjourn. Motion made by Joe. Second. Second by John. All in favor, because we're downstairs. Aye. 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 You can.